Hello everyone and welcome to this special video for EART 27201 Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils in which I'm going to be introducing Inkscape, a vector graphics program. I'll explain what that means in just a second. Just bear in mind that um, I guess this will be slightly less polished than some of my other videos because I'm going to be demonstrating a piece of software. Um, and so I've generally um, gone for a range of things that will um, try and keep this relatively short, but show you some of the, the kind of bits of Inkscape that will help lessen the learning curve for you. Um, I've put this up alongside a PDF document of a series of simple exercises you can do to get a feel for the software, which will then give you the skills that um, hopefully you'll um, be able to use to create more complex images down the line for both this unit, if you so wish, or any other unit as part of your degree or at any other point in your career once you leave university. So hopefully it will all be useful. But I wanted to start by quickly highlighting what Inkscape actually is. So Inkscape is a open source piece of software. That means that it's freely, freely available to um, whoever wants to use it. It's available on Mac, Linux, or, um, or Windows. Um, so you can install it on basically any computer. The reason I'm focusing on this rather than, for example, something like uh, Illustrator is because of the open source nature of it. Its um, code is maintained by a community um, uh, that means that it is free to use. So I think that's really useful. Whereas if I were to teach you Illustrator, you may not have access to that once you leave the university. So I guess you may have come across some similar tools to, to the ones that are available in Inkscape, but to be fair, slightly less advanced in, for example, PowerPoint. So I think this is a hopefully a, going to be a useful instruction and you can find Inkscape at this URL here at the bottom. But I said earlier that Inkscape is a vector graphics program. So what does that actually mean? Well, in the world of computers, there are diff basically two ways of representing any given image. This right here is, believe it or not, a picture of a baby cheetah. This is what they look like before they become top predators. Aren't they cool? I think so. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see what we typically think of as a photograph. This is actually a raster image. It has a series of small dots, pixels, and the photograph is stored as a file that just records a color for each one of those dots. Um, if you then render all of those dots um, next to each other in the right coordinates, you get a digital representation of an underlying picture. So all a digital camera does is capture um, those colors for those pixels and then put them into the correct file format. The other way, to represent computer, um, or I should say computer graphics, I mean graphics in computers, is via a vector file. So this on the right hand side here is a vector tracing of this image here. So vectors, as opposed to having, um, vector images I should say, as opposed to having pixels, are actually the native shapes themselves. So for example, this black blob here is recorded as a black blob, a line that's filled with black that represents that shape there. Obviously to put it onto the screen and indeed to use any of these images, you have to convert from a vector to a raster image. But often um, dealing with vector images is something we'll want to do. If, for example, we're dealing with a, a scientific diagram, we'll want all of our lines not to be hand-drawn, draw, but for them to be neat and crisp. And by far the best way to do this is to draw them as vectors, save them as vectors, and then by at the point that we need to use them to rasterize them. So that's a quick lowdown on computer graphics and indeed on how um, vector images um, work more generally. And here you can see um, those two images actually within uh, Inkscape itself, which is the uh, software I use to trace the raster image. I'm putting this screenshot here before diving on into the um, into showing you the software purely because there are lots of um, different versions of Inkscape. And if you're running Windows or perhaps Mac, this may look more like what you're likely to see when you open up the software yourself than the version that I'm running, which is on Linux. So just bear in mind that this is what the software looks like. 
you've got this kind of zone in the middle here this is where you deal with all of your drawings and stuff or your drawing things kind of like fiddling with your vectors changing colors for example um, or, or when you change colors you will see them in this zone here um, there are a series of tools down the left hand side all of which allow you to do different things to images and often there are toolboxes on the right hand side which allow you to to do something with the underlying vectors as well as having a color selector across the bottom here um, and a few other bits and pieces that I will show you once we get on to demonstrating the software. Um, so just bear in mind that what I see may look a bit different. Now in this document that I've created for you, there are a series of really simple examples of dealing with shapes and making kind of a bit of a silly picture, essentially whatever. Um, you can make whatever you want to in Inkscape, but it makes sense to learn it by making fairly simple shapes. This is a picture of a centipede that I created for a paper one time. Centipedes are great creatures, kind of vicious, but pretty cool, and I needed to draw one. So this is a drawing that was made in Inkscape that shows that you can, with the simple tools that I'm about to show you, make slightly more complex diagrams. This is by no means the, um, the, the best example of the full capabilities of Inkscape. It's just one that I happen to have lying around, but I hope that it will convince you, if you're sitting there being like, Russell, why are you showing us these super simple things that with all of the tools I'm about to show you, you can create more complex images for whatever purposes you may like to, to do, for whatever purposes you may like to use them. So uh, with that, I'm about to um, pause the video. I will um, switch over to uh, using uh, Inkscape and I'll unpause and we can start by looking at the software itself. I'll see you in a sec. Okay, and we are back. I've made myself a little bit smaller in the corner of this screen so you can um, see more of the software itself. I also, as you can see, made my um, cursor a fairly hideous red color in the hope that it becomes a bit more obvious, particularly against this white background. So this is Inkscape. This is what it looks like on my operating system, which I said already is running Linux. And so you can see that in the middle here, we have that white zone. This is where we do our draw drawing. We've got those tools across the left-hand side. We've got a series of menu options across the top here. And we've got some um, options on the right-hand side here. So just so you know, Inkscape works with a former file called the .svg. That's a kind of like a, an open source file format for vector graphics, which is actually a form of a thing called XML, which is a, a human readable language. It's actually text-based, which is quite interesting. You can actually look at these files once you save them and see the underlying text. But you can import a range of other file types when you load what if you want to. So um, it will look probably something a bit different to this on your screen, but hopefully it's enough to um, give you an idea of what it looks like. As you can see, um, I am currently moving around this image uh, space. I'm doing so by using my middle mouse button. So middle mouse button and drag allows you to move the space. You can also use the, the scroll bars here if you so wish. Um, I may want to zoom in at some point and I can probably do so using a tool, maybe this one. Oh yeah, look at that. But I tend to just use the keyboard shortcut, which is um, control and then scroll the middle mouse button. So the middle mouse button is all about moving this space around in the middle, um, in the middle here as you're drawing things. Okay, so some other things I guess I should mention. So this is kind of a nominal A4 page. Um, it is the, uh, the right proportions to be an a4 page, but the idea of size doesn't really mean anything in vector graphics. In a vector graphics um, package, you can zoom in as much as you like, and the shapes will remain relatively the same. You won't start seeing pixels. Um, that's only a thing that happens once you rasterize the image. And so um, here we go. I'm zooming into our A4 page. You ca I can, of course, and a very useful thing to be able to do, and indeed how I create all of your lectures is to uh, import um, raster graphics. So if I, for example, go to uh, the folder that I have saved the talk that I just gave you in, I can tell it to import a JPEG. I can embed it from a file and that will place, ooh, it's big. That will place the images that I've been using for our cover slides at the beginning of the, um, the lectures for this course, for example into um, this document. 
there are lots of things that we can do with an image like this. So I guess it makes sense for me to start off by introducing those. I can, for example, uh, draw a shape. I'm gonna show you how to do this in a minute here. Um, but yeah, so I can draw a shape and I can actually uh, use that to crop part of the underlying image. So what I've done there is I've drawn this weird shape here. You can just about see it. I'll get onto how to do that in just a second, but since I'm demonstrating uh, raster graphics, I might as well do it now. Um, I can hold down the shift key to select both that and the underlying image, and then I can go object, clip, set. And that basically just hides the bits of the image that aren't within the shape that I just drew. So it's a way of cropping an image, essentially. And you can put images into this piece of software to trace over them, for example. If you want to do that, you can organize the, um, the, the palette, the, the image, the thing that you're looking at here into a series of layers. So you can have the thing that you're drawing on one layer, um, sorry, the raster image that you're copying on one layer, I should say, and then you can draw above it on another layer. So it's a way of organizing your document. That's what this thing layers is about. So I can, for example, add a layer, I'm gonna call it layer two because I'm original. I can go layer, layers and then it appears here and you can see that at the moment we have two layers um this one the uh, has the image that i just put in i can lock it so i don't modify it anymore and now i can start drawing stuff on layer number two so i could for example draw a nice red circle over this and that's part of this layer number two and that helps me organize my life i can't accidentally move this underlying image that i may be wanting to trace so that's just a very quick overview of one of these tools and indeed how to use raster graphics in this package. Um, it's one of the things that I've put in this document. So the remainder of this video is going to be me essentially um, following through this document for you so you can see how I do things as we go along. So at the moment, this is kind of in the way. I'm just going to use the middle mouse button and I'm just going to scroll away from this page because I don't want to be seeing it. And one of the first exercises that I ask you to do is to create a square. So you can create a square using this tool on the left hand side here, create rectangles and squares, right? And I can just, I can just drag it out and I can create a square however I like. But also if I hold down control as I drag it, that keeps the aspect ratio at the point when I pressed control. So bear in mind, or actually no, it jumps to a, a range of different aspect ratios. You can see in the bottom here in the info panel on the bottom of my page. So I've asked you to create a, um, a rectangle, one that looks a bit like this, and I've asked you to color it in, and I've given you instructions to how to do so. But in general, though, the way you can color this in is by changing the stroke, that's the, the color of the line, and the fill of this shape. So the fill is kind of like the inside of the shape. And you can see that we've got both of those options here, but I can double click on stroke down here and that brings up a new panel, just in case you want to see that. So let's change the fill first. I want to change it to this nice red color here to match my exercise. So I am going to hold, no, I'm not gonna hold shift. So I'm gonna just click, left click on that color in this panel here and that will make it maroon. And you can see that that's been updated here. If you want to change it to a specific color, you can do so using this fill part of this window here. So for example, I could change the red levels, green levels, ooh, blue levels, and also I can change the transparency. So this is a thing called the alpha channel, which just says to the image how transparent this object is. But I want it to be this red, and I can just do that by clicking, left clicking on that color there. I also want to um, set a black outline if I am to match what I asked you to do in exercise number one of this document. So the way I'm going to do that is by sh holding shift and clicking on black in this color here. And so if I go to the stroke um, window here, you'll see that I've updated that to black. And if I zoom in very closely on the edge of this rectangle, you see it's got a black outline. That's way too small for us though, right? You can, you can hardly see it there at all, can you? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the stroke style and I'm gonna make it really thick. I'm going to change this, oops, I've got to select it first, to maybe five millimeters, let's have a look. Now still a bit thin, 10, 
Yeah, there you go. Um, and so you can see now I've managed to create the rectangle that I asked you to create for exercise one in that diagram. Just while I'm here, you can, for example, have uh, dashes if you want. That's pretty cool. Um, if you have something like a line, I'm just gonna draw a line here for the purposes of where we are right now. Um, I'm gonna make it five millimeters as well. And you can see that you can create arrows by changing the end markers on one of these things. However, I don't want this in the way. So I'm gonna go back to this tool here. This is the select tool. I'm gonna to, um, draw a select lasso around this thing by um, left clicking and dragging the box around it. That selects it. And then I'm gonna click delete. So I'm gonna return this back to being a solid line because that's what we want to match the exercise that I gave you. So that's a tiny bit of the, the things that you find the strokes are. So now we've got a rectangle with a red fill and a black stroke. So that is the start of where we want to be. You can change um, the size and the shape of objects in a number of different ways. So for example, if I click on this, you'll see it's selected. I can then drag it around, but also it's got these little arrows here. I can change its shape by um, and size by clicking on any of those and dragging and dropping it. If I hold down control, it will help keep the aspect ratio, but I can use this to create a shape, basically any um, dimensions that I want. So this is a rectangle, but we can equally use the tools here to create circles, stars, and even 3D cubes if we so wish. Yeah, let's look at that, great. But I don't want those, so I'm gonna delete them again. And I've deleted them all. And there are a series of other tools that I'll introduce in a bit. So, that's scaling objects, making them bigger and smaller and transforming them. So that's moving them up and down. I'm just looking, yes, there is a window here that allows you to do so by entering numbers if you so wish. So if you're doing something, for example, like copying a map and you have a known unit, you can actually set this up to copy that unit and to create things of certain sizes if you so wish. So just bear in mind that. You can also see for any um, object, is dimensions in the top window here. So this is 1500 millimeters um, in terms of its X position, 170 in terms of its Y position, 670 wide and 448 tall. So that can be useful to make two things the same shape if you ever want to do that. And this locks the aspect ratio of that object. So I can no longer um, change its aspect ratio if I don't want to. Unless I, of course, unless I, I click on this tool here which um, ignores that command. So I've created a, uh, a red square. In exercise number two, I ask you to create a star using the stars and polygons tool on the left-hand side. Um, and I've asked you to create a yellow star with stunning uh, obvious eyes. So I'm gonna do that for you now. So I'm gonna click star, click a star. I'm gonna create one like that. I'm gonna drag it down here. I want it to be yellow, so I'm gonna left click on yellow here. And I don't want it to have an outline, so I'm gonna shift and left click on that yellow to make the stroke the same color as the star. I'm gonna shove it somewhere in the middle here. So there are multiple things that we can do um, from this point. Um, for example, I may want the star to be centrally aligned to this rectangle. I can, of course, do that. If I say object, align and distribute, this window pops up. If I say, I want to align things relative to the first selected thing, I click on this square, I click on the star, holding now shift to allow me to click them both. I can then use this tool here to center the star relative to the square. So now we've got a perfectly centered star. So let's use that tool in creating some eyes. So I'm gonna create some circles here. I'm just gonna create one circle. I want it to be a perfect circle because I, I want these to be perfectly round. I've created a circle there and I want it to be white. So I'm clicking, there you go. I've now got a white circle. And I want to create a black pupil in the middle of this. So I could do so by creating um, a black film. So just by left clicking here. But actually, I think I may want to um, have a slightly uh, 
maybe I want to have a cross-eyed star, say. So what I can do is I can create a second cycle. Oops, nope, don't want to do that. That's one of the advantages of having layers. So you can accidentally drag stuff, but there you go. Oops, and I don't want to do that either. So that was just Control-Z to undo. I'm now going to create a second smaller circle, and I'm going to make it black in both fill and stroke. And I'm going to centrally align it. So I'm going to select one and the other, and I'm going to use these tools to centrally align it. So what I now want to do is maybe put one of these eyes onto our creature, onto our star. Now it makes sense really, since those bits are the eyes, to um, treat them as one object. So instead of having to move them both around all the time, I may want to do the thing that we call grouping them together. So to do that, I just go um, select them both, and I go Control G, or I go Object Group. And that means that henceforth, they are treated as a single object until I ungroup them. And that will allow me to say, for example, select one, press Control C, Control V, to paste it and then that will allow me to have another eye which I can then align with the first one and there you go I've got a beautiful star with eyes if I want to make this cross side like I mentioned I can ungroup those that's control shift G or it's object uh, ungroup and I can just move the pupils inwards a little bit towards each other and I can do this um, fairly reliably using the keyboard. So if you um, have something that's selected and you just click right or left using the arrow keys, um, you get a small shift, a small transformation. And if you hold down shift, you get a big one. So here you go. I'm going to hold down shift. I'm going to create, um, to move those both towards each other to create a slightly cross-eyed looking star. Very handsome star, I think. So that's pretty cool. And I may want to treat these as a single object again. So I'm just going to group them like that. I'll select them both and group. OK, so here we are. We've got through to exercise number two. And next, I wanted to introduce the idea of transparency. And let's do that by adding some sunglasses to this thing. So let's get another shape. Let's have some lenses there. Let's make them 90s lenses, nice and round. And so these are the lenses of some sunglasses. Um, let's make this uh, this ellipse that I've just drawn blue. Brilliant. And that's good. We've got some blue lenses, but I can't see the eyes through this. In order to be able to see the eyes, what I need to do is make this into a semi-transparent color. There we go. So now it's got a 50% transparency for the film. And I can just go to the stroke and I can set that to 50 as well. Hmm. And what you can see here is the fact that where the stroke and the fill overlap, it's actually um, created a slightly darker region. So I probably don't want to do this actually. What I think I probably want to do is get rid of my stroke entirely and just use the fill here and make that slightly bigger. There we go. So there's the lens of glass, my glasses. I'm going to do control C. I'm going to now use control alt V that will paste in place. And there you go. I've moved that one over using the keyboard. And now you can see that I've got these nice sunglasses for my weird star creature. I've got no idea why I came up with this. You could, if you want to draw something entirely different one year, someone drew themselves a boyfriend using these tools. It was, and a wizard at the same time. It was, um, you know, whatever you want to draw is absolutely all good. So the other thing that I introduce in this is the idea of, um, in this document, before exercise three, which is drawing sunglasses, is the idea of arranging. So everything actually, even within a layer, is in an order. You can move things up and you can move things down. By default, if I add something like another circle, it is added to the top. So you can see it, it goes over everything else. I can make that black like this and I can remove the transparency. That's for the stroke. Now I need to do that for the fill. There you go. And you see it obliterates everything else because it's on top. I may not always want that, right? I may want to send this down some layers. I may want to send it behind the other things. And I can do so using these tools here. So this one lowers something one step at a time. 
So you can see as I go down one, we go below the first sunglass lens, then the second, first eye, second eye. Or I can send things right to the back in one fell sweep using this button here. Now I've gone too far, I'm behind this rectangle, so I'll need to move it up maybe one step. And so what you can see here is that I've now managed to arrange this black ellipse so it's over the rectangle but under my weird star creature wearing sunglasses. Um, in order to finally achieve what I've got in exercise three, I also need to make sure that the stroke of this star matches the underlying color. There we go. And so you can see that now I've managed to create what I asked you to do in exercise three, which is having a, um, a star with a kind of a, a black halo around it. So the next thing that I've asked you to create um, uses things called paths. So paths are these, I mean shapes are examples of paths, but you can also have a path that is just a line. These are a really useful tool um, which allow you to create slightly, well, basically arbitrary shapes. One of the ones that I use most frequently is this tool here, which allows you to draw Bezier curves and straight lines. So what you can do is left click, left click, left click, left click, left click, all you like, and then when you're done, right click, and it creates a line for you. I'll make that a bit bigger, a bit stroke so you can see it, and you can see that I've created an arbitrary shaped line. It's got sharp corners, we don't always want that. If I left click and drag, it creates spline points. These are these things you can see drawing out here that creates curvatures between these lines. So that allows me to create pretty much any shapes that I want to do. So, and you can mix those two, obviously. You can have some um, round corners and you can have some, some sharp ones as well. So that's a really useful tool, for example, label di labeling diagrams. I've used it to draw a gray shape on this, um, this uh, in this diagram uh, for this exercise that I've asked you to do or suggest you may want to do in the PDF exercise four. It will take me a while to do that and I don't think you want to sit here watching me do it, but that's just done using tool the, these same tools. And so um, maybe what I will want to do is for simplicity, I'll create an arrow pointing to our creature um, creature here. So I'm going to create an arrow with a nice bend in it. There we go. So I'm going to label that bit of this organism. I'm going to add, I'm going to make the stroke a bit thicker. I'm going to add an arrow head to it because I think that'll be cool. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to add some text. So I'm going to add this text using this tool here. I'm going to say, my star. Isn't that cute? I'm going to make it a font that I want. And I'm going to make it a bit bigger. There we go. And I'm going to drag that. I'm going to put it in the right place. The only thing that I've missed out um, by not doing the, the thing that I asked you to create in exercise number four is the fact that you can modify these curves once you created them and you can copy and paste bits. So for example, um, I can take these points and I can move them as I want to change shapes. I can also join the lines together. So for example, I can copy this paste it. Now I've got two arrows. If I wanted to, I could select the endpoint of this one. So I've selected that using this tool here, which is for selecting um, nodes in paths. These control points are actually called nodes. I can select then, for example, the endpoint of this one as well by holding shift and clicking on them both. And I can, for example, join those two into a single glorious arrow pointing towards my star. Right? And by using these tools, we can create quite complex shapes. Oh, I removed the arrowhead um, from one end. So, so typically these things have a direction and the arrowhead is added to one direction, but you can add two arrowheads if you want to, like that. Um, what happens if I do this one? Oh, look at that. If this one adds stuff to nodes, which is quite interesting. I've never done that before. There you go. So that's great. I also, um, I sheared this um, rectangle a little bit. So if I did that by clicking on it once, clicking on it twice, and you can see that these arrows change, allowing you to rotate a shape or shear it if you so wish. So that's how I got the, um, the change in shape there. I highlight how to add text in this document, which I've just done here. 
And then I introduced the idea of adding layers. So I um, introduced that at the beginning here, but for example, you can put a raster image into a layer and then you can draw over that in another layer, allowing you, allowing you to organize your document into as many different layers as you may want to do. Ultimately, you may want to save your image once you've finished working on it. Obviously, you can do that in the vector graphics format for this piece of software. So I'm gonna just go file save. I'm gonna save this to my desktop, my documents maybe, and I'm gonna call it mystar.spg. Great. I tend to save quite a lot when I'm using Inkscape because it used to crash a lot more than it does nowadays, but that's just control S if you ever want to do it. And that creates a vector graphics image for you. So you can then open it on another computer or at another time and continue working on it. So that's great. If you want to use it in something though, you have to export it. So if you go file and then export ping image, you can see here, this window comes up. You can export either the page, that's this A4 thing over here, or you can export the image itself. So for example, I've selected this. If I select everything in fact here, there we go. I can then export the selection. I can tell it what image size I want. So for example, 2,500 pixels. That defines how detailed the raster graphics version of this you um, create is, how many pixels it has in it. Um, but also that dictates the file size of this. And you can give it a file name and then click export. Right, so there are lots of different export tools that you can have here. That will export as a PNG. A PNG is a lossless compression format and you can, if you so wish, convert that to other image formats using, for example, Photoshop or another um, tool such as that. So you may often want to convert these to JPEGs if you want smaller files than a ping. That brings me to the end of the exercises really and the tools I introduced in the document that is associated with this. And I hope it gives you a very brief introduction, I admit, to the tools uh, of, or that are available in Inkscape. A few of the ones that I haven't mentioned are, for example, the fact that you can do freehand drawing like this. There's even a calligraphy pen like that. You can do gradients. So here is our square, I'm going to delete everything other than this square. I've got a good feeling about this square. Isn't that great? See a star. I'm going to delete everything else. There we go. So I'm left with this square here. If I want to fill that not with a solid color, but with a gradient, I can do so. And I can modify that gradient using the gradient tool, which I think is one of the ones down here. I can't actually remember. It's going to be that one there. So that allows me to change the nature of this gradient for a true 90s style gradient. I'm gonna go, yeah, that's great. Oh no, I need to select this point here at the end. There we go. This is how I create, for example, the, uh, the faded out backgrounds for many of my lecture slides. That's useful to know about. Um, there are a bunch of other tools involving picking colors from images. Um, you can fill areas if you so wish um, and do a range of other things using these tools and, and of course measure things on the screen. Um, by default, um, everything kind of snaps together into a grid. So you'll see if I, for example, uh, draw another square and I move it up here, it clicks into place, allowing you to align things easily. If you don't want that, you can unselect that on the right hand side here. I find myself kind of vacillating, changing between um, wanting things to click and not wanting them to click. There are a whole range of other options, such as uh, rotating shapes, using these tools, reflecting them. Essentially, you can do a huge range of things um, when it comes to graphic design using Illustrator, and many more than I've had time to show you today. But 
I think that's a useful point for uh, which I can stop without really boring you regarding um, the miniaturate of how to use Inkscape, but hopefully having a good idea of the basic tools. And if you work through this document, um, you'll then have a, a clear idea of how to use them for hopefully creating diagrams and labeling raster images that you can import into the software. So I'll leave you there. You're welcome to ask me any questions that you have. Um, probably the practical is a good opportunity to do so. Feel free to bring a laptop and ask me about it in a practical. I will happily uh, feel those questions that you have. And in the meantime, I will see you in our next session. See you soon.